we ended the last video with talking about the magnetic field on the axis of a circular current loop. If we zoom out a little bit, we can see that the magnetic field of that circular current loop looks a little bit like a bar magnet, but again, we would stack a bunch of these current loops together or make a helix of current to create a solenoid that would look even more like a bar magnet. So a current loop has a magnetic dipole moment. And remember, magnetic dipole moment, that's where we're using the letter mu. Not the mu naught that is permeability, but just plain old mu. Um, and our current loop, if we have maybe a certain number of loops, more than one, we would say n times i times a. And again, that a is the area described by that current loop. So this area could be circular, that's pretty common, or it could be rectangular um, or any other shape that our current is kind of tracing a path around. Um, our current loop with this magnetic dipole moment has um, the potential for torque in an external field. Um, so there's a magnetic field produced by a magnetic dipole along the dipole axis that looks like this. And here I'm going to use the capital R for the radius of my loop. And I'm going to use X for my distance from the center of the loop. So this is just the same equation that we derived in the previous uh, video. So that's the magnetic field produced by the magnetic dipole along the axis. Um, and in terms of the magnetic dipole moment of a single loop, so the magnetic dipole moment of our single loop, which would just be I times A, our magnetic field that is produced from our loop looks like mu zero over two pi times mu over R squared plus X squared to the three halves power. Right. So this is just the same information as I gave you at the end of the previous slide, just making sure that we've defined what a magnetic dipole moment is. Um, and N is your number of loops for this equation. Okay, so how about another example? Let's do the Biosavart law for when we have a semicircular segment. Um, I want you to submit your own work of this on um, D2L for your chapter 30 worksheet credit. So let's say we have one quarter of a circular loop of wire that carries a current I. The current I enters and leaves on straight segments of wire that happen to be in this radial direction. Um, the straight wires uh, along this radial direction, we wanna find um, the magnetic field at the center point C, right? So we already have in our image here, um, our radial direction from a little portion of wire that we call DL. So we wanna look at what the magnetic field is for that. Now we're gonna start out with just our generic bios of art law. So our generic bios of art law looks like um, dB, and I'm just gonna do the magnitude for now. Mu zero I over four pi. We wanna look at the contribution, so the magnitude of DL crossed with R over R squared. So DL crossed with R hat. Um, if we look at our straight segments, this little DL and this little DL, the straight segments are gonna have no contribution to our magnetic field. The reason for that is that this DL crossed with R is gonna be zero if both our direction that we're looking at and our 
um, current are in parallel directions. We're going to have no um, contribution to our magnetic field in that case. So really the only thing we need to be concerned about is our semicircular segment from here to here, right? So our semicircular segment, we can figure out that using our right hand, we're going to point our fingers in the direction of DL. We are going to move our wrist around so that our fingers naturally bend in the direction of R, love my mitten hand, right? And when we do that, we're going to see that our thumb points towards the screen or into the page. So at this point, B is going to be into the screen, right? And we're going to have that contribution for all of those DL along that semicircular path. So we can do the same thing for along the straight segments and see that we can point our thumb any which way and DL crossed with R is not going to work out. It's so just remember your cross product. DL crossed with R is just going to give you the quantity DL. The quantity of R hat is one, sine of the angle between them. And so if they are in the same direction, the sine of that angle gives you a big fat zero. Okay, so all we need to look at then is that all these little dBs are going to give us mu zero I over four pi, DL and R are going to be perpendicular to each other. So perpendicular means sine of theta is going to equal one. So we're just going to have DL as our cross product and R squared at the bottom here. So we're going to integrate this to get the overall contribution. So, ah, that is not what I wanted to do. It's all right. So we're going to integrate our our db over the course of all of this stuff. So mu zero is a constant, i is a constant, four pi is a constant, and we've got dl and we've got r squared. So the only thing that's not a constant here is dl, so we're going to integrate over dl. And we want to look at what we're going to have. So we're going to have a quarter of a circle when we're done here for our path length. So what we're going to have is this mu zero times i over four pi r squared, and we're going to have one quarter of a circle. Now a circle is going to be two pi r, right? That's the circumference of a circle. So one quarter of that is going to be half of pi r. So when we simplify all of this, we can go with mu zero i, four pi, one of these r's cancels. Actually, oh, how much do we want to cancel? One of those r's cancels. This two and this four, we've got two, this pi and this pi. So we've got mu zero i over eight r as our answer there. And you can do this with any kind of portion of a circle. So you can do, say, a half circle. It'd be a really similar uh, um, logic with uh, your integral over DL. And in fact, your book has one of its early examples, the um, magnetic field due to a curved wire segment. So they give you a portion of wire that's curved and talk about what that magnetic field would be. So this is really similar to one in your book, but it's a little bit different. All right, moving right along to Gauss's law in magnetism. Gauss's law in magnetism, the first thing we actually want to define is this idea of magnetic flux. So you remember when we talked about electric flux, we talked about electric field lines punching through a surface. Same thing with magnetic flux. So we're going to define a magnetic flux as being what are the field lines that are punching through a little portion of surface area um, and then adding up all those contributions. 
right? So if this is a dot product, we can define that magnetic flux in terms of the magnitude of the field, the area, and the cosine of the angle between that field direction and the normal of that area direction. So remember we define a normal of an area as pointed out as being perpendicular to the area. Right? So the net magnetic flux through any closed surface is always zero. That is what Gauss's law and magnetism says. So Gauss's law and magnetism says the net magnetic flux through any surface area, and I should say closed through any closed surface is always zero. Excellent. So in math, that very long sentence says that if we close a surface and if we define flux in this way, we're gonna get zero, right? So that is Gauss's law for magnetism. And we'll look at some applications of this. Um, one of the big things about this is that um, the unit of magnetism is the dipole. So you always have a north and south pole. So you always have incoming and outgoing magnetic field lines together. So if you close around your magnetic dipole, you have a net magnetic flux of zero. So you have magnetic flux going out, magnetic flux coming in, but in net, you have zero magnetic flux. So we've got to evaluate some dot products when we talk about Gauss's law and magnetism. So you need to picture what you're talking about when you say that the area is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So here in image A, when you're talking about the direction of the area, remember you're talking about a normal from the plane that that area describes. So when you're saying that the area is perpendicular, we actually see that the sheet, this uh, tan colored sheet of area looks like it's going parallel with our magnetic field lines. But again, the direction of the area is normal to that plane that the area describes, okay? So when we look at that image in A, you can see that the flux through that plane is zero, right? So when the magnetic field is parallel to the plane surface or perpendicular to the direction that we would describe the area as being, we've got a big fat zero for flux. And we can picture this, the magnetic field lines aren't puncturing that surface. Now, in contrast to that is picture B here, which says the flux through the plane is maximum when the magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the area, or in other words, it's in the same direction as the normal to the area. So the dot product is maximized when we are in this situation here on the right. Um, if we go back one slide and look at our description of the dot product as being the magnitude of B times the magnitude of A times cosine of the angle between them, Yes, it is maximized when our area, our normal of our area, which is our direction of the area, is in the same direction as the magnetic field lines. I am gonna pause there and bring it back with some more um, things, just uh, magnetism and magnetic moment of ions for our final lecture of this chapter.